right, everybody, it is Wednesday, and that means it is time for Q&A. I always look forward to these. Now, this past week, I had a lot of questions submitted, so that's good news. The only negative part of it is that I'm not going to be able to get to all the questions that were posted. So if your question was not answered, please take a minute and continue to post it on subsequent videos each Wednesday so that I can get to them. And I will. Now, this week, I have one bonus question. So it's actually going to end up being six questions. I'll explain why at the end, toward the end, when I get to that last question. But let's go ahead and take a look at our first question right now. Is it a good idea to regrade a PSA MK or PSA ST with SGC since SGC doesn't have those designations? Ooh, yes. I think this is a great idea. People hate qualifiers. PSA did qualifiers from the beginning and it was off center, it was miscut, there were stains. There was a variety of different qualifiers that they would use. So you'd see a card that might be an 8OC and you're like, okay, it's an 8, but it's off center. So what is it really? And what really happened is people just, even still, they just really don't like them. They don't buy them. So a few years ago, PSA really started going away from qualifiers. Occasionally you'll see one pop up if there's like no border at all, they'll put a miscut. But for the most part, they very rarely do qualifiers anymore, but there are still a bunch of cards out there that are in qualifier holders. And if you were to look, I mean, I'll give you an example, 1959, uh, tops Bob Gibson rookie card. High number card, one of the best pitchers of all time. And that card is historically very, very off-centered. As a result of it being off-centered, a lot of those got graded early on because it's a valuable card because it's a rookie card of an all-time great. And so what happened was a lot of them got graded, a lot of them got OCs. So if you were to search for like a PSA 7, PSA 8, Bob Gibson, you're gonna see a lot with an OC qualifier and they don't sell for much. They sell for probably a couple of grades below the number. So if it's a seven OC, it'll sell for like a five. And, and I've actually mentioned this to my dad a few times that I think it's a buying opportunity because you can buy a card that's a seven or an eight with a qualifier that has sharp corners, it has a good color, but you know, it's off center. And so what I think is a, is a good idea, and this question really points to it is, get it regraded. Now, you might wanna go SGC because then you know it's not gonna get another qualifier, but as long as it's, you know, 80-20 or, you know, 90-10 even or better, 85-15 side to side, top to bottom, it's, it's, it's not probably going to get an OC qualifier from PSA anymore. And we know it's not going to get a qualifier from SGC because they don't do those qualifiers. So I think cracking it out and getting it graded from, you know, an SGC is a good idea. I think cracking it out and maybe even resubmitting it to PSA because it's so much less likely that it would get uh, a qualifier since they very rarely do them anymore. So I think this is a really good opportunity to get a nice looking card. Now, if centering drives you nuts, then that's probably not a good move if you're planning on keeping it. But I have seen some people do exactly this you know, there are a lot of YouTube videos out there. And, and one of the things that I've seen a lot of people do is buy a card in a qualifier, crack it out, send it into SGC. Maybe it comes down one grade, but people will buy it because it doesn't have the qualifier label. I think the reason qualifiers don't sell for much is because people don't really know what to make of it. 
how does it really rank if it's an 8OC? Does that make it a seven? Does that make it a six? Does that make it a five and a half, a six and a half? People don't really know where to rank it. And so because of that, a lot of people um, don't wanna buy them. Now, if it's a card that you're keeping, then you should do whatever you like and you should buy a card that you like. But if it's a, a card you're trying to turn, I think there's a buying opportunity there. I think that's a really smart move to consider cracking it, resubmitting it to either PSA, but probably safer to submit it to SGC since you know it's not gonna get a qualifier. I think that's a great idea. What Hall of Famers from the 50s, 60s, and 70s would you chase for your personal collection, baseball and football? All right, so this is, this is a, a great question, but it's sort of a personalized question, right? Now, if you're asking me what players you should buy and target and get runs up for your collection, I don't, I don't feel like I can answer that because your PC should be full of cards and players that you like, um, not players that I like. So my PC are guys that I like collecting. Now, who do I like collecting? Now, you specifically cite here baseball and football. So if we're talking football, there's really about five vintage players that I have multiple cards of. Um, I think I'm missing one Gale Sayers card. Um, I'm waiting on the right one. I think it's a 69 tops is the only one I don't have. That, that would be the one missing from my Gale Sayers run. So I, I really like Gale Sayers. Um, his highlight reels are insane. Uh, I have a lot of Jim Browns. I don't have the rookie because I, I want to get a, a nice one, but nice ones are expensive. Uh, I'm missing the 61 Fleer. Uh, I'm missing the 68, uh, no, 66 Philadelphia. And I have pretty much the rest of them. Um, I have several Johnny Unitas's. I have a second year Johnny Unitas. I think it's in a six. A uh, third year Johnny Unitas in a six. Um, I have quite a few Bart Stars. I tend to collect sort of the, the MVP type players of that era. Um, I have multiple autograms. I think I have a 52, 53, and 54 autogram. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of collect some of the greats when it comes to football. Um, as far as baseball, I kind of collect the guys that I like. Now, I've, I've seen and interacted with more baseball players. I've, I've been to shows and seen baseball players. You know, I've been to spring trainings and interacted with baseball players. So I have more experience actually, like, getting to know some of the players. So I have certain guys that I kind of like just because of the interactions that I've had. So, like, I'm a really big Yogi Berra guy because he's such a sweet guy. He was such a sweet guy. So Yogi Berra is a guy I, I target and, and like to collect. Um, I don't have a ton of his cards. I have some of his cards, but you know, over time, I, I know that it's a marathon, not a sprint, as far as my PC is concerned. So I'm, I'm big on Yogi Berra living in Northern California. I have a soft spot for Willie Mays. You know, I read an autobiography on Ted Williams when I was in sixth grade and absolutely loved him. So then that, that uh that winter i had a uh there was a card show in sacramento at the sacramento community center and i met ted williams i got his autograph for 39 dollars uh, at a card show and he was so nice to me and so i'll always be a ted williams guy so i'm big on those three guys um but i like in when it comes to baseball i like having just you know at least a couple of cards of a bunch of different guys like how could anybody not like, you know, Ernie Banks? Um, another thing for me that I've really gotten more interested in lately is I have so much of an appreciation for people who overcome um, obstacles. You know, as a teacher, I, I look at some students who have rougher upbringings than others, but they're able to overcome those obstacles. So I have a huge appreciation for a lot of those Negro League players that played in the Negro Leagues, were so successful, and then ended up in the majors. 
Like I have, I, I have a huge appreciation for what they had to go through because I really have no idea of what they had to go through, but I'm sure it was awful. So, you know, I have some, I have a, a Larry Doby. I've got a couple of Monty Irvins. In fact, I just bought another Monty Irvin card. I bought his 51 Bowman rookie uh, just a few days ago. Um, you know, Minnie Minoso, Satchel Page, Jackie Robinson. So guys that have a, a story of overcoming some sort of, you know, difficult situation, I have a, I have a, an admiration for and I like to collect. So um, those are kind of the guys that I would say that I, I pinpoint, but quite frankly, there aren't a lot of vintage major league guys that I don't like, where I'm like, no, I don't want his card. In fact, off the top of my head, I can't even think of somebody. I mean, even some of the guys that were, you know, fierce competitors like a Bob Gibson, <laughs> I actually, I, I admire that about him. I really like that about Bob Gibson that, you know, if you got too close to the plate, he'd throw one behind you. Um, I, li I like that about him. So even kind of the 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 rougher characters at times I like a lot so I I don't have in baseball a couple of guys that I just make runs of but that's kind of my point of view on who I like and who I, I kind of keep an eye out for since the Evan Mathis trimming video came out last week it has renewed the debate over how many vintage cards are trimmed do you think off-centered vintage cards will be more in demand since they likely aren't trimmed? Oh man, so this is a really, really interesting one. So over the last week or two now, I'm sure a lot of us have probably seen it by now, but Evan Mathis, who's a former NFL player and a sports card collector, and you know, kind of famously is in the news because he had um, a 52 mantle. I think it was a PSA nine. Um, and, and he came out with a video very recently where he's showing his technique on how to trim cards, which cards to trim, how to trim them, his technique for making them appear to not be trimmed. If you've not yet seen it, it's probably worth watching just so that you're aware and in the loop of it. So if you just type in, you know, Evan Mathis trimming video, it'll, you'll find it. Um, quite frankly, the whole thing makes me sick to my stomach. Um, I, I personally have a major issue with lying and deceit. I don't like it when people lie. I don't lie. Um, it bugs me when people try to take advantage of others. And to me, that's really what is happening when somebody does anything to a card like that. Now we're not talking about a card has a little bit of surface wax and, and you, you know, take a, a cotton t-shirt and just kind of gently take it off. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about altering a card. And that's, that's just, that's just like the worst thing in collecting is doing something like that, in my opinion. To the question of, does this mean that off-center cards will be more valuable? Because people will know, well, that's probably not an altered card, because if it was all altered, they would have gotten it centered, right? So maybe, I, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't recommend going out and buying a bunch of off-centered stuff because the prices are gonna shoot up. But I will say, personally, I like cards with a rough cut. Like, I like them. I, I like them probably better than cards that don't have a rough cut. So, like, my Gale Sayers rookie card on one of the edges has a very rough cut. And, and the reason that cards have a rough cut is because back in the day, you know, when the quality control wasn't as good and the blades would get sort of dull by the end of a shift of cutting cards off of the sheets, the, the cut wasn't as clean. And so it was more of like a tear kind of, and it would have a little bit of a rough edge to it. 
And so I've never personally understood marking a card's value down or taking the um, grade down on a card for a rough cut. I, I mean, I understand it, but I certainly don't mind it. And the reason I don't mind it is because when I see a card like that, I go, I know that card's authentic. That's how that card came out of the pack. Nobody messed with that card because the first thing that someone would do to alter a card would be, you know, take like a, a nail file, like an emery board or something to the edge of it to clean up that edge, right? So that's part of the authenticity of a card to me, having that rough cut. So I don't think I would, I would tell you go out and buy off-centered stuff. I wouldn't tell you to go out and suddenly buy a bunch of rough cut stuff. But I would say probably be a little bit more careful. Um, maybe have a, a loop with you or a heavy magnification with you. And if you're buying an expensive card, maybe look along the edge of the card under high magnification because the cards that have a more recent cut, they do have a little bit more of a fiber uh, to the edge under high magnification. It's almost like little hairs are hanging off the edge of the card that is very difficult to duplicate. Um, so I would be more aware of it. I would be, I'm, I, I'm certainly a little bit more leery of buying a raw card now than I was a month ago because of that. I mean, I have bought cards that when I submitted them, they came back as under the size requirement. Does that mean they were under the size requirement when they were cut? Or does that mean they were, you know, trimmed? I don't know. Um, but I'm definitely more leery today about buying ungraded stuff. And yes, I understand the whole point of the video was that his method, his technique even gets by the graders. So hopefully, um, it will add a little bit more um, of a careful eye from grading companies to be have an extra eye out for that sort of thing. How do you feel about autographed vintage cards versus regular vintage cards? Added value or is it a ruined card? So this is one of those things where my opinion on a lot of stuff has has evolved. It's changed over time. You know, for example, for a long time, I only cared about corners. Centering meant very little to me. Um, now I care more about centering than I do about corners. Um, I remember as a kid going to shows and seeing like a really nice vintage card and then it was signed and I'm like, oh, you ruined the card. Like why, why would you do that? Get the autograph on a picture or on a ball. Keep the cards as cards. That's what they're for, is to be cards, not to be signed. And I felt that way for a long time. And then, you know, a few years ago, as I would kind of, you know, dabble a little bit into cards, I wasn't as into it now, then as I am now, but I remember seeing some of these guys who had, who had died you know, these players who had died and their cards were signed. And all of a sudden, it was it was kind of cool. Now, you got to remember, when I was going to shows in the 1980s, it was like literally 10 bucks, 5, 10, 15 bucks in 1987, 88 to get an Ernie Banks autograph, to get a Gaylord Perry autograph, to get a Hank Aaron autograph. Like you say, this guy's crazy. He doesn't know what he's talking about. No, no, literally, that's how much it cost. Like, I remember that's what it cost. Again, we paid 20 or $25 for Mickey Mantle. And that was in, uh, let's see, I was in about fifth grade. And so I was about 10. So that would have been in about 1988, 89, something like that. We paid $25 for Mickey Mantle. I remember spending $39 for my Ted Williams autograph when I was in sixth grade. So yeah, four years before that, three years before that, when I started going to shows, Ernie Banks was 10 bucks. So 
it didn't seem like a huge deal. And I didn't understand why you do that to a card. But now, now the thought of having, you know, a 1955 Jackie Robinson that's signed would be amazing. Having a 51 Bowman Monty Irvin rookie that's signed. Having a, a Hank Aaron, you know, 56 top signed. That would be awesome. So I think my opinion has changed. I could see people going, no, autographs stay in the lane of autographs. Cards stay in the lane of cards. I get that. I do get that. But I also, for me, I think it's kind of cool having a card that is signed by the player that you can no longer get signed anymore. In fact, I was at a show not that long ago, and I remember I, there's a card I wish I had gotten, and I'm kind of hoping I see this dealer again. It was a 1951 Bowman, Bob Feller, signed by Bob Feller. And it was a, a fairly reasonable price and I didn't buy it. And now I'm like, why didn't I buy that? That would be so awesome. I know Bob Feller signed a lot of autographs and there's a lot of them out there, but it's still on a Bob Feller 1951 Bowman card. So I like it, but I understand why people don't want that crossover and they want to keep things separate. When I was a kid collecting baseball cards in the late 60s and 70s, it was a fun and inexpensive hobby. Now speculators with a lot of money have ruined the hobby and turned it into a high price gambling game. What happened and what changed? <laughs> I, I, love, I love this question. And I've talked about this a little bit over you know the past few months, but um, I'm happy to, to continue to talk about this topic. First of all, so what happened with sports cards is there used to just be base cards, right? There, there used to just be, you know, 86 tops, 86 Fleer, 86 Donruss, and that was what there was. And then they slowly started to do insert cards, right? Some autographs here, some gold label here, and then some numbered stuff, you know? So once we get to about 2000, now all of a sudden there's some like rarer cards than other cards. There's different parallels, right? And then, you know, a few years ago they started doing, and again, we're talking maybe 2001 or two, there started to be more and more of like the memorabilia cards. You know, my brother pulled a card one time that has a piece of Babe Ruth's bat and it's cut in the New York Yankees logo and he pulled it from a pack and I remember he was like oh my gosh like this is crazy and it is that is crazy but that stuff was just starting to happen I remember my brother also pulling he was more of a pack guy I was more of a buying a single guy he pulled a, a card that was uh, you know hand signed by Tony Gwynn from a pack and, and that was like unheard of to me. I was with them when he did it and we were like, oh, this is crazy. And, but they've gone full blown off, off the deep end now, the stuff that you can get, like, you know, the, the patch, the auto, the patch and the auto, the numbered patch auto. I mean, it literally, it literally is like Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory where you're opening Wonka bars, trying to find one that has the golden ticket. Like, it is like the dream come true to pull certain cards. It is literally legalized gambling. I, I, don't, I don't really know how it's even still legal to have a pack that you could buy for, you know, $100 that could have something that's worth $200,000 in it and, and the fact that people would pay $200,000 for it is just as crazy, it's just as wild. So I think what happened, the reason things went away from just collecting cards, it was just fun and innocent to like full-blown investing, is the value of some of these cards because of the rarity, because the companies went full-blown Willy Wonka. And let's be honest, it's working for them. People are, every day are paying hundreds of dollars for a pack. They'll buy a, a, you know, a box, which is a pack of national treasures for like thousands. 
right? They'll, they'll buy, you could go on any, any social media platform right now and watch a live break where people are, are spending a lot of money to do it. And it's because of the amount that these cards are selling for because of the rarity. Now to me, to me, a lot of that is, it's like cryptocurrency. Now, some of you are going, oh boy. No, it's like cryptocurrency. It's like, it's valuable because people say it's valuable. It's supply and demand. The supply is obviously low of those things. The demand right now is high for some of those things. Will it stay high? I really think a lot of that's gonna, gonna correct. And I mean, I mentioned the other day, I was at a card show a week and a half ago and I'm going through a value box and there were some like one of five, you know, Deshaun Watson cards that I know would have been selling for hundreds and it was like 30 bucks. And so I think a lot of these, uh, it's this huge speculation and then potentially a huge crash, but a few of them, there are a few Pat Mahomes out there, right? There are a few, you know, Shohei Otani's out there. And there are a, a few of these cards that will be pretty valuable for the long haul because there is a demand for it. The demand's not from me, but the demand is out there. So I think what happened was, as soon as they went away from just base cards and they started doing all these parallels and they just one up the parallel and now it's like, you know, used in the NBA Finals patch with an autograph numbered one out of one. Like that's gonna have some value if it's, you know, a Wilt Chamberlain forever, it's gonna have some value. But it, it just got, it just went full blown Willy Wonka. Like cards went full blown Willy Wonka. So that's my take on it. But I think a lot of those people, when the correction really hits hard, and it's already happening, they're gonna need to, they're gonna want to stay in the hobby, but they're gonna realize that the ups and downs and they get burned a few times, they're gonna say, I need something more stable. And I think one of the things I'm starting to see it shows is some of the dealers that were a lot of new stuff. It used to be three cases of new stuff and one row of vintage are now half of their cases are vintage and half of their cases are new stuff. I think they're gonna stay in the hobby because they like it, because they're making money at it, because they have connections in it, and they're going to slowly start to transition out of modern and into vintage. And that's where I think a lot of the increased demand for vintage is gonna come from, is existing people in the hobby, but we're not in vintage stuff yet. That's what I expect. And that's a big part of the reason why I am high on vintage football because I really think a lot of the newer collectors, a lot of the modern collectors are football collectors. And I don't think they're gonna go from modern football to vintage baseball. I think they're gonna go to vintage football. So I think vintage football is, is the you know five to 10 year plan. I think it's vintage football, I really, really do. But again, that's just my opinion and uh, so I, I think baseball will always have demand too. I mean, baseball's, you know, that's the tradition, but I, I think vintage football has a lot of legs in the, uh, in the not too distant future. If you could take one hall of famer from the hall, who would it be? And who would you replace him with? All right. My bonus question. So these two guys, man, check their channel out. How, cool is it for dad and son to be doing cards together but vintage cards and the reason i think the vintage card thing doing it together is so cool is because think about what little guy is learning about he's learning about supply and demand he's learning about business he's learning about how to talk to people how to make offers sales he's learning about profit margins 
He's learning about history. He's learning about how to spend quality time with dad. There's so many things that kids could be doing right now with their time that's not the best, but that is as good as it gets. So support these guys. To your question, guys, which I love the question. I guess my response is a little bit hard because I don't really understand what uh, they're doing with the baseball writers are doing with the Baseball Hall of Fame right now. Because they say they don't want to have players associated with PEDs, but then there are some players that are associated with PEDs. So if you're to say remove a guy, now I don't ever want to disparage anyone. I don't want to ever say you aren't good enough. So it's hard for me to say out of all the players in the Hall of Fame that there's someone who doesn't deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. That's not something I I enjoy kind of, you know, saying something negative like that. With that said, there are some players in the Hall of Fame who I think have clear PED association. I mean, ESPN has come out and, you know, named players before they were elected that they tested positive. And you say, well, they tested positive, but they tested positive when it was supposed to be anonymous. So it didn't, it doesn't count. I don't, I don't, I don't know if I understand. Um, there are other players who their statistics were really, really good year after year after year. And then all of a sudden in 2004 ish, when we started, you know, having mandatory testing, their, their stats tanked and they never hit over 300 again, uh, when they were doing it every single year before that. So if I had to pick somebody who's in who shouldn't be in, I lean toward, well, if, if Bonds and Clemens aren't in, then none of the PED guys should be in. So I would, I would tend to point toward a PED associated guy, whether we want to admit it or not. If we're talking about just clearly on merit, I mean, the easy one who everybody loves to throw stones at is Harold, Harold Baines. I think that's a little harsh on Harold Baines. I mean, he did have almost 3,000 hits, but he was just like pretty good for a really long period of time. You know, a lot of people rip on Phil Rizzuto and say he shouldn't be in. You know, there's, I think, you know, I think that you could maybe make an argument that they, they were good for a long period of time, but not great. You know, Fergie Jenkins, people say that about sometimes. Necro people say that about sometimes. I guess I, I have to take, if I, I'm going to play the game, even though I'm not, I don't really like saying that anybody, you know, doesn't belong, but, you know, Jim Rice is another guy who I think is somewhat questionable. If I had to pick one, I think I'd pick Harold Baines, um, but that's an easy, that's an easy choice. Um, and I'm sure just me mentioning some of the guys I just mentioned is, is irritating some people, but you know, it's my opinion, I guess. Uh, who would I add? Well, obviously Bonds and Clemens I would add if since there are already PED players in the hall. But if we're going to go people who have no association to PEDs, um, I got to go Thurman Munson. I mean, the guy's career was cut short because he died. I mean, he was year after year. I mean, for a catcher to year after year be routinely hitting over 300. I mean, I think he batted over 300 what, like five out of his 10 years? He's in a position where there's never gonna be huge statistics because he's a catcher and the abuse that those guys took. He was a leader. I mean, the Yankees had him as, as captain of the team. You know, he was very well liked, very well respected, won an MVP. I mean, there's so much to like about Thurman Munson. And, and I believe that if he'd played for another five years, I think he's for sure in the Hall of Fame. But the fact that he died, not only does he die, but now he doesn't get in the Hall of Fame because he died. Like, I, I just don't get it. So to me, I'm putting Thurman Munson into the Hall of Fame. If I had one pick to wave my magic wand, that I'm going Thurman Munson. And sorry, Harold Baines, but you're the low man on the totem pole, bud. So... Tell me what you think about that, but also tell me what you think about these other answers. I always look forward to hearing your responses. And please, down below, submit your questions for next week. 
If you submitted one last week and didn't make it in, please submit it again to this video though, so I have a place to find it for next week.